Retinal Rounds, episode number 144, Retinal Incarceration. In our last episode, we showed you a case of a perforating globe injury with focal retinal incarceration. In continuing this theme in this episode, we'll show you the management of a complex retinal detachment with retinal incarceration in a patient with prior penetrating open globe injury. Traumatic retinal detachments can be some of the most challenging cases for vitro-retinal surgeons to perform, and it's remarkable to see how well-managed this patient was by our guest surgeon, Dr. Andrew Farag, a second-year vitro-retinal fellow in Galveston, Texas. Let's see how he manages this case. So this patient is a 30-year-old male who sustained a knife attack causing a penetrating injury to the right eye. The limbal laceration extends from 4 to 7 o'clock with posterior extension into the supranasal quadrant. Primary globe closure was done three weeks prior to retinal surgery, and you can see that he has a supranasal iridodialysis and significant corectopia. The lens is poorly visualized here, but is subluxated inferiorly. His vision is hand motions, and the intraocular pressure is 11. Here's the vertical axial B scan showing a subluxated crystalline lens and total retinal detachment. On kinetic exam, the retina appears to be mobile without stiffening or fixed retinal folds. Okay, let's check out the management of the case. You can see here that, uh, again, the patient has significant corectopia. In order to get good visualization of the posterior segment and the subluxated lens, some iris retractors will need to be placed. You can see here that Dr. Farag has created a small paracentesis, is filling the uh, anterior chamber with some viscoelastic, and using 27 gauge, um, a 27 gauge needle, uh, small uh, paracentesis are made into the anterior chamber to accommodate the iris retractors, which are then used to expand the pupil. Okay, that last iris retractor is going in, and now you can see the subluxated crystalline lens. And so this is a really important step, just uh, placing the iris retractors to get good visualization of the posterior segment. Um, you can see here now some uh, trocars are being placed. Uh, this is a, going to be a three-port parse plane of vitrectomy, and Dr. Farag is going to use the cutter to remove uh, the crystalline lens. So here he's checking to see uh, the tip of the infusion cannula. He's not seeing it, and so he's pushing this uh, trocar in a little bit more snugly, snugly so that it's uh, flush with the scleral surface. And now he's going to go ahead and place his, um, his infusion line, again, checking to make sure that it's in the vitreous cavity. Again, a very important step to make sure that you don't infuse uh, into the suprachoroidal or into the subretinal space. Now, two additional trocars are going to be placed, and a, uh, a lensectomy is going to be performed here. So you can see he's using posterior segment uh, visualization and using the cutter, uh, some of the vitreous here, and that lens is going to be engaged. Now, this is a young patient, and so in younger patients, of course, the lens is going to be uh, uh, much softer and uh, can be typically removed with the uh, vitreous cutter. You can see here as he's uh, cutting uh, the lens and removing the uh, vitreous adhesions to the lens uh, that it becomes a little bit more mobile and it appears to uh, drop down to the posterior segment. And now he's just going to remove a few air bubbles uh, that are uh, against the corneal endothelium interfering with his view. And then he can go back to uh, the work here. Again, important to main uh, maintain good visualization. So I like the extra steps that Dr. Farag is taking so that he can see uh, see well in, in the posterior segment. You can't perform uh, good surgery if you don't have good visualization. So now uh, you can see that uh, partially um, uh, dislocated crystalline lens there over the posterior pole. He's going to go ahead and aspirate that lens and bring it up into the mid vitreous cavity. And so first you want to just aspirate the lens, bring that up into the mid vitreous cavity. And I like that he's uh, pointing the cutter up towards the cornea, so anteriorly pointing the, uh, the cutter so that he doesn't inadvertently engage any of this, dis, um, this detached retina. Now he's uh, using the vitreous cutter to uh, elevate up uh, the uh, uh, areas of the hyaloid that are still attached. A uh, good idea here also just to put in some triamcinolone. This is a younger patient. Given the trauma, uh, it's most likely that the patient has a PVD, but always a good idea just to uh, reconfirm uh, with the assistance of triamcinolone. A few little uh, areas of preretinal membranes are peeled there. And now perfluorocarbon liquid is being instilled over the posterior pole. And you can see here, actually, the retina looks pretty good. There are certainly some areas peripherally. There's a supranasal incarceration site that needs to be addressed. But already, the, uh, the macula is actually looking pretty good, and this patient might have reasonable vision potential. So you can see here some of the Schlieren, uh, uh, this uh, proteinaceous thick subretinal fluid that's uh, been... Um, that's been squeegeed out using the PFL. And now using the vitreous cutter, he's going to aspirate that to get, again, good visualization. And you can see that supranasal uh, retinal fold that's present. 
So now he's, uh, he's performing a limited retinectomy here using the vitreous cutter to disengage the, uh, the retina from the incarceration site. Now one thing I would recommend doing here is to apply some diathermy before performing uh, a retinectomy. It can uh, uh, decrease the risk for uh, bleeding when the, when the retinectomy is performed. Uh, also you want to make sure that the cutter is uh, at a lower vacuum level so as to not uh, inadvertently engage the choroid and cause a choroidal hemorrhage. Um, so now you can see that the, the retina is, um, uh, the retinectomy is uh, being extended here and um, it looks like there's still some fixed retinal folds that are not uh, allowing the retina to completely flatten and so Dr. Farag is taking down the PFL and is now looking into the subretinal space. So he's got uh, both the uh, forceps here in the right hand, the light pipe in the left and uh, he's identified some subretinal uh, uh, membranes that appear to be contributing to the persistent uh, retinal folds. Uh, you can see that uh, a nice uh, posterior to anterior peeling approach. So you want to try to grab that membrane at the posterior most extent and then try to strip that up to remove as much of it as possible. Now PFL is going back into the eye and you can see here the retina is completely uh, attached and, um, and those folds in the super, particularly in the supranasal quadrant uh, have uh, resolved. Now Dr. Farag is going to air He's uh, 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 taking down the PFL, drying uh, around the retinectomy site, and is applying endolaser around the uh, retinectomy edge. Uh, some silicone oil is placed into the posterior segment, and the uh, sclerotomies are sewn shut. Okay, you can see the iris retractors here are being removed. Uh, and in these eyes, with uh, the patient being aphakic with silicone oil, you want to have an inferior peripheral iridectomy, but you'll recall that this patient has significant choroctopia. So in this case, Dr. Farag opted not to uh, create the, uh, the inferior PI given the pupil. You can see here the patient at post-operative month two. Uh, the vision here is counting fingers. The intraocular pressure is 18. And here's the fundus photo. The retina is completely attached. And of course, if it stays attached uh, in the future, this patient will be scheduled for oil removal and anterior segment reconstruction. So here's some take-home points. Retinal incarceration often requires a limited retinectomy in order to relax the retina proximal to the incarceration site. Now, prior to performing the retinectomy, you'll want to apply diathermy to decrease the risk of bleeding uh, when you actually incise the, the retina. Since the retina may be close to the underlying RPE and choroid where the retinectomy is performed, you'll want to avoid any iatrogenic damage to the choroid, which can result in significant bleeding. So aspirating up the tissue to create more space between the retina and the underlying RPE uh, and cutting using the shave mode uh, or a decreased uh, vacuum level can help to decrease the risk of inadvertently cutting the choroid. In this case, persistent retinal folds were noted even after a limited retinectomy at the, uh, at the incarceration site. And when this occurs, one must uh, make sure that the retinectomy completely releases the retina that has been incarcerated. Of course, you could see that Dr. Farag had done a pretty broad uh, retinectomy in that supranasal and nasal quadrant. And of course, PVR can also be a cause of folds, especially in a post-trauma eye. And Dr. Farag nicely demonstrated taking down the PFL and inspecting both the preretinal and subretinal space. Now, since he had access to the subretinal space from the retinectomy site, he was able to peel those subretinal PVR bands, and that ultimately allowed the retina to flatten completely. Now, a couple of last points, post-trauma eyes and, and especially young patients are at high risk for PBR. So placement of a scleral buckle uh, and even the use of methotrexate can help to decrease the risk of a PBR-associated retinal redetachment. Now also remember that hypotony can be an issue in these eyes and can compromise outcomes in about 20% of patients. So uh, performing a thorough anterior vitrectomy with scleral depression and removing the capsule, both of which were done by Dr. Farag, can help to decrease the framework upon which anterior PVR can form leading to hypotony. Now overall, this is a very well-managed case by a young surgeon who clearly has a bright future ahead of him. So thank you, Dr. Farag, for sharing this case and for giving us all an opportunity to learn more about traumatic retinal detachment management. If you enjoyed this video, please visit us at retinarounds.com. There you can sign up for our email list. You'll get a notification every time a new video is posted. And if you have an interesting video or a tip or trick that you'd like to share, please follow the links on our website and you can upload your video there. Thanks so much for watching.